the Fall 2020 Hinkle, Pryor, and Fisher Parent Empowerment Conference, Realities for a New Reality. Two days, 25 workshops, renowned speakers and presenters, by families, for families, nearly 40 hours of unfiltered and straightforward information made possible by the leaders in disability rights advocacy for over 45 years, Hinkle, Pryor, and Fisher, Attorneys at Law. So welcome to this session of our ongoing Encore presentation series of the Fall 2020 Hinkle, Pryor, and Fisher Parent Empowerment Conference. So, Welcome and thank you for attending the Hinkle, Pryor and Fisher Virtual Parent Empowerment Conference. My name is Maria Fisher and I will be moderating this workshop, which is entitled Self-Directing a Home for Your Special Needs Adult Child. And our presenter for this session is Dinah Fox. Dinah served as the president of D.Y. Fox and Company, a marketing consulting firm between 1999 and 2018 helping to develop growth strategies and new products for clients, including Coca-Cola, General Mills, Campbell's Soup, Cadbury, oh, Cadbury Adams, Seagram's Beverages, and other Fortune 500 companies. Before starting her consulting firm, she worked in the corporate world, helping achieve growth for Fisher-Price Toys and M&M Mars. She continues to be a strong advocate for the special needs community and has been overseeing the Morris County Special Needs Parents Group for the past 17 years. The group invites speakers to speak to parents on a wide range of special needs related topics, including special needs housing, DDD, Medicaid, guardianship, personal preference programs, East to Seals, and et cetera. She was elected and served on the Board of Education in Randolph Township, where she lives and has raised her family. She's an active member of her community, enjoys hiking, traveling, and is relishing in her newest role as a grandmother. That is so exciting. Welcome, Diner. We'd love to have you. We're excited for you to be here. It is always great to hear from a parent, so please take it away. Well, thank you very much for having me. Um, I want to tell you about my daughter, who is uh, Robin, and is now 31 years old. And she has been living in her own condo, which we purchased for her more than 10 years ago. And she has 24-7 staff. We have built a life for her, and I want to share how we got there, what works, and what requires ongoing effort. In all honesty, she leads a rich, fun-filled, happy life. And I have to honestly say, it's an enviable life, even for a non-neurotypical 31-year-old. Um, she's definitely achieved, if not surpassed her potential, and in truth, exceeds my wildest dreams. When Robin was a little girl, I desperately wanted someone to walk me through options, what lie ahead for her. I was very worried. So let me tell you what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about five things. One, the models, how, what I learned about and what led me to this model for Robin. Two, funding for Robin's home. How do we pay for it? What are the agencies involved? What are the challenges and efforts that it takes on my part ongoing? Three, staffing, important. Um, we wonderfully have three staff members who have been with Robin for over 10 years now. So longevity is really important to me. One who's been with her five years. Four, I want to talk about work and volunteer opportunities. And I want to lead you as parents to know that I had to create them on my own. Um, she does work at a gift shop um, called Presence of Mind, but she also volunteers at a hair salon at the Mary Hart Nursing Home, at a actuarial firm, and she feels good about her life. And last, I wanna talk about recreation and social life. Robin has a very busy social life. Um, again, over time, we really built that for her, and I'm gonna talk about her annual Winterfest where she hosts a large number of community members who are in her circle of support and I, how we leverage community 
music concerts, school concerts, musicals. And as parents, I'm going to ask you, are you leveraging community services sufficiently? So that's what I'm going to talk to you about. And I am happy to answer any questions, but I'm going to ask that you hold them to the end. I have a lot I want to share. We will have time. I'm not going to take 90 minutes to speak. Please note down your questions, or I want to make this offer very genuinely to you. I'm going to give you my email. So if after this presentation, you would like to reach out to me, I invite you to do, do so. I am available to talk. My email is Dinah, my first name, D-I-N-A-H dot Y, my middle initial, dot Fox, F-O-X, my last name, at gmail.com. So again, Dinah dot Y dot Fox at gmail.com. People have helped me, and as parents, we know we need one another. So if you want to reach out to me, I will answer you. The answer is yes. I do have, yes. Just jump in for a second because I did forget to save us at the beginning. During the presentation, if you have a question, use the chat feature. And then at the end, when Dinah is ready for questions, I will go through the chat feature and I will uh, read the questions to her. Um, so if anybody can find that chat feature on your screen, just please use that during the presentation. Thank you. Sorry. No problem. Um, I do want to have, I do have a couple of caveats and one is your child will be different. Um, they may have different capabilities. They may have different interests. And to be honest, you may have different wishes for your child, but I am sharing details with you to prompt your thinking. Even if the actual details are not what you or ch your child might like. Some of the things I tell you may not apply to you. They're just ideas. You may get a different budget than my did, daughter did based on her level of, his level of disability. If your child is much higher function, they may get a lower budget, but you may be able to have multiple people in a house and share the staff and budget. It may work differently. Um, one a uh, woman who's become a friend has a nonverbal, non-ambulatory, non-toilet trained daughter who in fact used the same model um, as I'm sharing with you. My daughter is verbal and ambulatory, so it can be generalized. So let's go to the background and tell you about the model. When Robin was younger, I desperately wanted to know and learn what might be ahead. I didn't have a mental model, and I lost a lot of sleep worrying about that. Um, I had a mental model for my son. I have two children, Robin and my son, Evan. And having gone to college, I knew whether he was going to go to a trade school or a community college or get into Harvard, I had a mental image of what lie ahead for him. I could direct him to AP classes and try to get him on the honor roll and have resume building activities and learn study skills and social skills, etc. I wanted for him a sense of pride to achieve his potential, have ambition, and find happiness. I didn't know what lie ahead for Robin. Uh, fortunately, my son went to University of Pennsylvania, graduated from Wharton. He's now a partner in a financial firm on Wall Street, and he has a wife and two children in Livingston. So I'm very proud of him. For Robin, I worried because I desperately wanted to talk to other parents who have older children to see what they had done or could done or might be done for Robin and also for my husband, Bruce, and I. I lost a lot of sleep, and Robin woke up in the middle of the night and disrupted my sleep. Uh, she can't shower herself. Robin does not read, does not write. Uh, she can't count 10 objects. She is verbal. She is ambulatory. And I didn't know what her life would be like. What options existed for her, for her care, for her housing, for work or day programming, for recreation? I was unsure. I didn't have a mental image. Would I trust others? Would they be caring? I had a lot of fears. I acknowledge that even as her mom, caring for her is not always easy. And I feared others would not want the job 
or would lose patience or would be mean to her. So what did I do? I went to visit group homes and day programs. I wanted to see what options existed. And I'm going to tell you what my perceptions, which may not be yours, of group homes were. And I actually encourage you to go visit. If you have young children, do it. Make it your business to do it. I found very high turnover, an average of every six months, and those were in the number of ARC group homes I went to visit. There were many speak English as clearly as they might have. And oftentimes they would leave for another job for only 50 cents more an hour. One of the things I perceived is that all the residents in a home did activities in tandem. It wasn't individually based on their personal interests. I also found parents were not very involved. In fact, they were not really wanted to be engaged. Management preferred parents not, quote unquote, interfere, get in the way of management's wishes, directions, rules, guidance. Of course, I had fears for Robin, whether sexual abuse, physical abuse, verbal and psychological abuse. I was not sure I felt so comfortable. Um, Robin is most anxious with new people, so high turnover is a concern or an issue. Um, she's very innocent, but she doesn't have such great language skills, so she often taps people. She touches them. She wants to engage with them. She's a little bit of a space invader. She's cute, and unfortunately, that can at times be misconstrued, and I fear, quite honestly, that it would be misconstrued. I also worried about the ratio of staff to client, especially in large group functions. So I was a little rattled. Um, similarly, in work settings, I was finding uh, that I was worried because Robin has ADHD and she doesn't sit still and she has a hard time keeping from vocalizing. Robin has some motor issues, has right hand limited coordination. Some of the work centers needed no talking or to stay seated, and they were based on peace counts. For Robin, background noise is very distracting. It's hard for Robin to focus and loud noises are overstimulating. But having said all that, Robin's greatest strengths are is that she's endearing. She loves social acknowledgement. She makes people smile. She has limited speech, but she has packed phrases and social banter. She cannot speak in paragraphs. She cannot explain stories. Um, and she has word retrieval issues, but she can have a conversation. So what would her future be like? What would be the mental model? I didn't want her in an institution. What did I hear about? What did I find that was of interest to me? One, there was uh, seven high school friends who rented apartments in a complex. And on the grounds, there was help for them. But my daughter can't really be left alone, so I didn't trust her for fire or 911 emergencies. Another model that I liked was uh, the five friends in Whippany, New Jersey. There, there's three women and two men, and together the families bought a home. And I was very impressed, and still am, that they had very long term caregivers. Uh, Nancy Delaney, who was one of the moms and a key person in the orchestration of this house, shared with me that with a lot of TLC, tender loving care and acknowledgement, she successfully has kept staff. She taught me about giving holiday gifts and having a holiday party, having birthday gifts and personal thank yous and acknowledgement. Seems intuitive, but it was very nice and I live by that today. Um, what do we want for our daughter? I want, and Bruce wants Robin to have reason to get up every morning, get dressed and go someplace, have be active and have a fun filled life, not sit around watching TV, which actually doesn't hold her attention very well, but have places to go, things to do, people expecting her. I want her to make a contribution in her own way. I want her to really feel proud of herself. I want her to give maybe more than she takes. Robin can't cook independently, but she can help prep food. I want her to set the table, make her bed, do what she can. I also want her personal grooming. I want her to look nice. One of the things about group home residents often is they look disheveled and sloppy. 
Robin has enough going against her that I want her to look nice and be dressed nicely. And when I have staff for her, I want them to help facilitate conversations for her in the community. I don't want them to sit on their phone, roll their eyes and not do things with her. I want her to be healthy and exercise, but I also want her to be a part of my family. And I had to figure out how to build a life for her. To be honest, the prospect of showering her and bathing her for the rest of my life was depressing. So I had a lot of motivations to figure this out. One of the things I learned, though, is that there was an exceedingly long wait list for DDD, Department of Developmental Disabilities, budgets. I would go to special needs parents meetings and there would be parents in their 70s. I'm not making this up. In their 70s, waiting for their DDD budgets. And they still had their special needs 40 or 50 something year old living at home. Well, I learned about an out of state residential age out. Um, in essence, what that is, is rather than wait on the waiting list, um, if you send a child to an out of state residential placement, no guarantee, but there has been precedent set that when the child ages out of that 21, at 21 years old, there's a hope of you getting a DDD budget. Um, in fact, Paul Pryor and Maria Fisher can tell you more about that. Uh, but we took a gamble. It was a risk. Um, when Robin was 19 to 20 and 20 to 21, we chose to have her go to a school out of state for the sole reason, singular only reason, was in hopes of getting a DDD budget after 21. I will tell you, I went up and down the Eastern Seaboard. My husband was not completely on board at the time, looking at schools. And a lot of them, I could not have slept at night if she was going to be there. Uh, there was very high turnover. A lot of the staff was tattooed and pierced. And we were standing in the room with directors and the staff was rolling their eyes, engaged in their phones, not engaged with their clients. I would not have slept at night. Um, we did find a program that we ended up finding to be very acceptable. In fact, I, I want to share that I think they were wonderful, and that is the Benedictine School in Ridgely, Maryland. Um, wonderfully, as opposed to these other schools where students would be left 365 days a year, at the uh, Benedictine school, every student went home because they shut down the school every six weeks for a long weekend. That was a fall weekend, uh, Thanksgiving weekend, Christmas weekend, just kind of like a college curriculum, college calendar. And I love that because I could see if Robin had bruises or scratches or was upset or happy or sad. And importantly, the whole staff got a much needed break. And when I brought her back, there was a teacher conference on returning. So I got to speak to the teacher in her classroom and I saw the school was immaculate. They cleaned that school top to bottom, but I also got to see if Robin wanted to go back. And when Robin went back, she told everybody, I'm going back to college, just like her older brother. And for the sake of the rest of her life, I was willing to have her go to a residential school because the staff there had been there a very long time. The teacher she had had been with the school 32 years, Mrs. Slama, in fact, today is Mrs. Slama's birthday. Um, and Mrs. Slama was there not only for Robin, but for me. Every time the phone rang, I was afraid Robin was sick or would be kicked out or something would happen. And wonderfully, Mrs. Slama reassured me and could tell me what was going on. The end of that story is, we did get a DDD budget when she turned 21. And the model that we were pursuing was to buy a house with an agency and get a COA grant, the Council on Affordable Housing. And in that model, the agency would buy the house, we would make a significant $50,000 contribution, but the agency would own it and the town would have 
contributed 150 or so thousand dollars. All very nice. One of the things about COA, and I share this with you because if you want to, you can go to your township and ask how they're meeting their COA obligation, Council on Affordable Housing, because special needs individuals get one and a half credit per person, and they don't add to the school district's school population as opposed to some poor individuals, low-income individuals who have big families. That's a big deal for the town. So I share that with you. Put it in your bailiwick of things to look at. Well, at the 11th hour, 59th minute, the agency pulled out. Bruce and I chose to go forward and we bought the condo. We had to put more money on the table and we have a mortgage, but we have a beautiful three bedroom condo. And while we initially wanted a roommate to have one live in and then two young women, that actually hasn't happened. Uh, 10 years ago, 2010 was about the time of the Olmstead Act where they were taking uh, residents out of the developmental centers. And a lot of older people who had lived in developmental centers for 20, 30, and 40 years were getting budgets, but not young girls in their 20s and 30s. Also, and I share this openly, there were parents who wanted to drop off their daughter with me and have me do all the work. I did not like that idea. One woman was divorced and wanted to run off with her Bruce, boyfriend, Bruce, and that, that's my husband's name also, I'll not forget it. And I thought, no, thank you, I, I don't want that. Thank you, but, but no, thank you. Um, now we've been happy with her in the house for 10 years and we don't want the additional drama, the additional drama of a new roommate, the staff for that roommate, the parents, you know, at this point, thank you very much. You've done this for 10 years. I do want to tell you that once we bought the home, I was absolutely shocked and surprised. People came forward unexpectedly. A decorator said, I want to help you decorate your house. This is, was a friend of a friend. So annually we might go to a holiday party and this, her name is Pam Barron, friend of my friend Trudy had seen Robin growing up and offered to decorate the house with me, which is wonderful. And friends offered furniture, TV, even one friend offered an original painting. So I want to tell you that somehow it kind of worked out very nicely. Okay, funding. Now that we bought a house, how did we pay for it? Our DDD budget at the time in 2010 allowed for rent, utilities, cable TV and phone, condo maintenance, staff, which of course is the largest part of the budget, as well as activities. You could pay for yoga and a YMCA membership. Um, if Robin went to bowling or movies, that budget would not pay for it. Robin had to pay for that out of her SSI, Social Security. But if the aide took her to a movie or bowling, their activity fee would be reimbursed. Transportation fees at 31 cents per mile reimbursed, but no food was included. Okay, now we had the budget. We knew what we could include in it. And what I learned and what drove me to self-direction is if we hired an agency, they charge $28 an hour for each hour of 24 hours a day. And Robin's budget would not afford that. I could not have an agency run her home. But I learned that if I self-directed, I managed to make the finances work. And my daughter could have 24 seven care. At the time, the maximum hourly rate I was allowed to pay staff was $15 an hour. And then with a 22% premium to cover uh, Easter Seals, who was the fiscal intermediary, which means they paid the paychecks for the staff and took out vac uh, FICA and taxes but they also provided vacation time, sick time, and if they worked overtime, time and a half. So it came to $18.30 an hour, which is a huge $10 an hour difference between the agency or if I did it directly. Big difference. Plus, I learned, and in fact, I had a very nice support coordinator and I 
um, got good advice from her. And then I actually sat down with a wonderful woman, Nita Das, who's been with DDD and a support coordinator for 30 years. I took her out to lunch and I said, help me through this. How am I going to make this work? And she recommended having a live-in who gets room and board. They get 40 hour full time, but then the overnight sleep time, she does not get paid because she's getting uh, rent and utilities. And that enabled me to have a situation uh, to uh, have 24-7, that threw me off, um, staff. So I want to say, if you need help, just like Nita does, I took her out to lunch. If you want to sit down with me in COVID, we may not go out for lunch, but email me. I would do the same, seriously. So it requires more from me to be self-directing, but it affords my daughter a much richer, fun-filled life which I'll describe in a few minutes. Let me tell you a little bit about the fiscal intermediary. This budget that Robin got from DDD, I do not touch. I do not write checks on it. I do not manage, well, let me just say, I budget it, but I don't touch that money. All the bills are submitted to the fiscal intermediary, Easter Seals, and they pay them. Yes, the mortgage we took out on the house was not, you know, we couldn't submit all of that. So we did um, know that we would pick up the difference in rent. A few hundred dollars a month for my daughter, I was fine with. But the Easter Seal system was a very nice system. It was not too taxing. Essentially, it covered expenses except for rent differential without an agency. And it covered most of it. I would submit my utility bills and Easter sales would cover them. I would have, of course, set up a budget for it. The house manager, so one of my staff, could handle this. Authorization, a voucher, send it into Easter sales. They would pay directly to the utilities. Um, they were not writing a personal check from either my account or Robin's account. Long term, this was a very nice model. You could hire someone to handle this. In addition, Easter Seals was the employer of record. What does that mean? That they deducted FICA and taxes, but they also handled vacation time, overtime, sick time. I didn't have to. I didn't have to have employees coming to me and say, you owe me another two hours. It was my issue, which was wonderful. In addition, if your budget allowed, and if you had full-time workers working over 35 hours, if you had the money to pay for it in your budget, they could have health insurance. They provided the health insurance, which is a very big deal. Who wants to work full-time for years and not get employer-provided health insurance? In addition, they did background checks. And I'll talk about how I hired people, but they did the fingerprinting, drug testing, check their driver's record, uh, check their registry of past violent abuse cases. I appreciated what they brought to the table. Then a couple of years ago, I'm not sure if it was four or five now, DDD hired a new fiscal intermediary, Public Partnerships, a very different model I'm not very happy about it, and I will tell you what changed. Um, they are not the employer of record. The parent is the employer of record specifically so that they don't have to provide health insurance. They do not, will not provide health insurance. Personally, I think that's mean-spirited. They do not provide sick time, vacation time, no time and a half or overtime, besides no health insurance. So if you're the employer of record, well, nobody's ever sued me, you could be sued, and I don't feel comfortable with that. In the, whatever it is, four or five years since they went to this new fiscal intermediary, they have, we've been frustrated and uh, lobbied, and now they have what they think is a new system, agency with choice. And once again, Easter Seals, is now again available as an option. 
So how do you do the annual budgeting to make it work? The live-in aid gets 40 hours full-time, rent and utilities and basic food. If she goes crazy with lobsters and whatnot, you know, of course we don't have to. And she worked five overnights a week. Nobody should work seven days a week. What is nice though, in my case, the uh, live-in aid, that was, this home is her only residence, her primary residence, her only residence. So she has no rent elsewhere. And if there are snow days or somebody doesn't come in, uh, she oftentimes you know, would pick up when someone would not come in. So that was a wonderful backup. Then we would have weekday staff uh, to take care of daytime activities and then weekend staff. Uh, so the living would have the time off. And I'm telling you this because that's how we made the finances work. Uh, the weekend staff oftentimes had a full-time job during the week and would come Friday evening from 7 p.m., stay Friday night, all day Saturday, Saturday night, and leave on Sunday at 10 a.m. Uh, they would get paid an hourly rate during the day and minimum wage at night. And for them, it was a good gig. They would get about $500 to $600 a weekend, and we had alternating weekends. So we would have two different weekend people, and they would come alternating weekends. Um, if I hadn't self-directed, the money would not have been sufficient. Okay. Under this previous model, I would have a quarterly visit by our support coordinator, um, which was lovely. And she would help me manage the budget each year and we'd have a sit down and say, you know, does this budget work and who are your staff and how much do you want to pay them, etc. And the only other thing was Robin couldn't exceed $2,000 in assets in her name. Well, then DDD changed the model. They now wanted to get federal reimbursement from Medicaid matching refunds, which I understand makes physical sense. And they went to a fee for service model. I want you to hear this because if you pursue this model, it's changed some. Now out of Robin's DDD budget, there is no rent, no utilities, no cable, no phone, no condo maintenance, big change. Utilities not covered and I either pay for them and write a personal check from my account or from Robin's account. While, and I'll walk you through, I do seek uh, monthly utility assistance subsidies. Some months it covers, but then when the subsidy runs out, we have to pay for it. A lot of difference. So that's financially a big change. And you'll ask, what am I doing with the freed up DDD budget funds? If I cannot spend it, but they kept the same DDD budget, what am I doing with those funds? I'm now paying my staff more. While $15 an hour was the maximum, now I pay my staff $18 or $20 or $22 an hour. I also have a higher quality of staff. And I told you, I've had a tremendous longevity, three people with us, a full 10 years and one already five years. But at a real cost to me personally, now I have to manage the rent, utilities, getting low income rental vouchers, and we'll talk about that in a middle minute, but it also has longer term implications, financial implications, financial risk. So I will now talk through how we're handling that. What are the sources of additional money? Write this down. First is PPP, personal preference program. This, was, this is essentially a program to help individuals who need help showering or activities of daily living. Someone who showers independently would not be eligible for this sort of funding. This was originally intended for wheelchair bound individuals to help them get dressed, to get showered, et cetera. Um, and Robin does need assistance, so she is eligible. A nurse comes to evaluate Robin every six months and determines how many hours per week she is eligible for. They assign a number of hours based on her needs, and those hours per week 
become the monthly budget. They can pay more or less per hour, but I just have to stay within the bu budget. And a huge difference from the DDD is that parents are allowed to provide these services and get paid. So personal preference program. And in truth, we do, Bruce and I get paid for some personal preference program funds and we use that money to pay for her rent and utilities. Second, low income rental assistance, a rental voucher. If you haven't, get on the wait list because it can take years to be called for a rental voucher. Um, even once you get it, there's a process. The house uh, or apartment must be within fair market value, so they have strict spreadsheets of permissible rates based on your county. And that fair market value has to include all utilities, and it's not always easy. And even once you get a rental voucher, there's an annual renewal. You have to have an inspector come to your home. You need income verification, so I have to provide the most recent bank statements. I have to show up for a Morris County Housing Authority meeting to sign new papers. You have to show most recent pay stubs, Robin's income, her utility bills, her social security statement, a copy of her lease, and we see the payment of the lease. So suddenly, while Easter Seals was paying the rent before, and I didn't have to do any of this, suddenly, every year, and it comes up quickly, I have to reconfirm, revalidate her low-income rental voucher. In addition, third, utility assistance is the Universal Service Fund credit. Uh, you must demonstrate the need and you must again reapply each year. It's basically the same financials, her bank statements, her, uh, bank, her pay stubs, but they usually ask at a different month, so you gotta make different copies. Um, the utility company, uh, you have to send the bills and they automatically deposit the credit into your utility account. And again, this comes up quickly. Fourth, food stamps, SNAP. Um, again, separate application every year, bank statements, etc. Doesn't come to a lot of money. Robin gets $16 a month in food stamp assistance. And the last one is low income phone service. There is a USA Lifeline plan where um, Robin has a landline. It only allows for local outgoing phone calls. So she can call 911, call a neighbor, call me. No long distance calls, but unlimited incoming calls. So her grandparents or friends can call in. And that comes to only $2.14 a month. So I want to articulate that it took time to apply and get all these assistance programs that I had not had to earlier. So it's challenging. It takes time to administer on my part and it seems like I'm always chasing something down. So I wanna be frank, be honest, and that change, I'm not happy with DDD and I think we can communicate with them, but that's the current system. Staffing, staffing is critical. How do you make it work? Well, I wanted to go through the stories of how I find my staff because uh, that's what most parents ask about. Um, the house manager, uh, Michelle, we've known since she was 16 years old and she's now 35. 19 years, she's been part of our family and she's like a sister to Robin. What had happened was that one night, Bruce and I were going out with some friends, Lee and Lois, and our babysitter canceled. We told Lee and Lois, we may not be able to come. And they said, well, my son's dating a young woman, Michelle, maybe she'll babysit. That's how we met Michelle. Michelle, coincidentally, um, has a father who was a director at the Matheny School for Special Needs in PPAC. So she grew up with special needs individuals her whole life and was very, very wonderful with Robin. One summer, she was a nanny. She lived in my house and... Uh, practically, we practically adopted her. Uh, she did go to college, and um, that was the time when Robin was at the Ridgely School in Maryland, and she had a corporate job, 
And when we got the funding for Robin, I asked her, would you be Robin's house manager? She actually left her corporate job to work full time with Robin. She's wonderful. She's a godsend. She has since gotten married. We attended her wedding. She has two beautiful children. And for a while, she was a stay at home mom, only working part time with Robin. And she's like family. So we've adopted her. What does she continue to do even part time? Scheduling of staff, month in advance, the weekday, the weekend. And if someone has a wedding or some other function in advance, Michelle, to her credit, takes care of it. She also is wonderful at helping me find fun things in the community, activities um, for Robin to participate, parades or uh, music uh, festivals. So she is wonderful, has been with us 10 years, and I love her. And if she stays with uh, us for the rest of our lives, we would be thrilled. Um, the live aid, Edie, who's been with us a full 10 years, I'm telling you these stories because you have people in your lives who you might want to talk to about what would you want to do or would you be willing if we developed a house for my child. Um, I was at Jazzercise and Bonnie Weiss, also at Jazzercise, who had retired as a child study team social worker for Robin, had had Edie as a living nanny for her children years before, decade before, her children were now grown with children of her own. And uh, having that introduction, I was thrilled to talk to Edie. And Edie has been very reliable, very punctual, really caring and responsible, saves the day in many cases. She's wonderful. Another young woman, Lauren, had been a patient of my husband, who's an orthodontist. And one day we had a party and asked if she'd help with serving and she met Robin and they got along really well. And we asked, would she be willing to work with Robin? And 10 years ago, she was a nursing student and she worked with Robin on Sundays. Well, now she's a full-time maternity nurse at Morristown Memorial Hospital, but she insists on staying a part of Robin's life. She insists on working with Robin one Sunday a month. She doesn't need the money. But she's now, again, part of the family. It's like um, Robin has another sister. She loves seeing Lauren. Uh, and weekdays, we have a wonderful woman. Her name is Cheryl, who's a certified teacher, a master's in special education, and has been with us for five years. Wonderfully, she does all kinds of projects with Robin, tells Robin, you're on fire. You're doing great work. She cheers her, and Robin says, I'm on fire. I did a great job. And we have Cheryl to thank for that. Wonderfully, we've had other staff members and we have them stay in our lives. They've gotten married, had children, and we know their husband, their children. And even if they come to visit once in a quarter, once in a year, they're part of Robin's life. And why am I wasting your time telling you these stories about my staff? because I didn't think we would find people to be kind and caring to Robin. I didn't think we would, but we did. And there may be people in your life now who may stay or may help or may help you find or recommend someone. Yes, it takes time to interview people, check references, train them and build relationships and provide that TLC but with effort, you can find wonderful people. And maybe they'll stay a decade or hopefully longer. And you want to know something? My husband and I are comfortable. My husband recently retired and his fantasy was to spend two months in Tuscany. And you know something? We trust our staff. We went to Tuscany for two months. I never thought we'd have that option after we had Robin. I also want to tell you that all but one of my staff have a college education and they're fun and they like Robin. Let me tell you a few comments. Where have I gotten these staff who I haven't had personal recommendations from? <clears throat> Care.com. I didn't pay an agency. The agency fees are very high. Care.com charges you $32 a month only for the month that you need to be using their services. 
And wonderfully, Michelle has often done phone screenings and uh, identified the candidates that she thought I should interview. Then I usually meet and interview them at a Starbucks or a Panera. Why? I don't want Robin to be upset with an army of people coming through. I don't want to get her all stressed out. And only those I'm really serious considering, seriously considering do I have meet Robin at the condo. It is stressful. It's not an easy process. It's not quick. Easter Seals then does a hiring process which can take weeks, which I've already described, fingerprinting, drug testing, driving records, and then training my staff. Robin is on medication. She's anaphylactically allergic to dairy. She has allergies. I have to teach them the time sheet, the house rules, what we do or don't want to have happen in our house. Um, also a communication book. All staff has to write after each uh, session with Robin what went on. Um, and the scheduling process and uh, my expectations. So I am engaged, but you know what? I could go to Tuscany for two months. I could go away a weekend. My husband and I don't have Robin 24 seven and Robin has some independence. And I'm not over 70. I am 10 years ago, I was 52 years old. Yes, there will come a time when I won't be able to do all of this, but for now, it is working. I want to share with you also something we learned, a week in review. Because we have weekend staff, weekday staff, overnight staff, and as I said, sometimes the weekend staff are different every other week, and Sundays different, we started writing an email before each weekend to all of our staff, even those who might not be working that weekend, but also to Bruce, my husband, Evan, my son, and Mindy, his wife. Of all the activities coming up, if there's a birthday party, where it is, how to get there, what time, if there's a show, the time, the tickets, the address, what clothing to wear. But also, we discuss in the Week in Review what Robin did during the week, what were her activities, help with her language. The weekend staff says, oh, I heard you went pumpkin picking. I heard you had a dance. All those things to prompt the aides to know what's going on, a communication vehicle, but also to prompt Robin to feel proud of her week, sharing, bring them up to speed. Also to create a team spirit. Uh, the team staff don't know one another. If they only work the weekends, they don't know the weekday staff. So it's a nice way to kind of communicate and maybe even praise some of the staff, oh, they did this wonderful thing, but also medication changes, doctor visits, etc. Importantly, my son, he's now 35, he is one of the co guardians. Bruce, myself, and Evan are co guardians. I advise anyone who can, when you become legal guardian, if you know who you might like at your demise to be your legal guardian put them on then. My son will not have any further legal issues, hurdles to jump to become guardian because the legal work is already done. I want him to know what's going on in Robin's life. Um, also, some staff are not as good at taking the initiative to do fun things. So I will identify them. Here are fun things for you to do. The objective is more fun activities. If Robin has fun and the staff has fun, everyone's happier. So this week in review I just share with you has had a benefit. Okay. Now, what are her activities, her work and volunteering, especially pre-COVID? COVID, all of this goes down the drain, but I want to tell you about her work and activities. Robin works two days a week four hours a day at Presence of Mind, a gift shop in Flanders. How did I learn about this gift shop? Robin's child study team didn't tell me. Her DDD worker didn't tell me. Her support coordinator didn't tell me. How did I learn about it? In Jazzercise, there's a Down syndrome young woman, Susan. And I asked her where she worked. And she works at Presence of Mind. I went to visit it, a lovely gift shop 
in a lovely strip mall. I found that Robin could have an internship during the summers prior to graduating at 21. Try it and get adjusted. She doesn't have to sit quietly in one place. She puts price stickers on merchandise, sets up displays, helps customers, help gift wrap. And even at Christmas when they have a large uh, online order, she helps with the packaging and walking things to the post office. Yes, it's run by a special needs provider agency and out of Robin's DDD budget, they get paid. But very nicely, they give a small check to Robin and Robin feels proud. She takes the uh, money to the bank. That's one of her work options. A volunteer option, she was volunteering at Mary Hart Nursing Home and she would go and speak to the residents and Michelle, who was wonderful, and Robin got to know a number of residents. A very nice story is a woman by the name of Grace looked forward to Robin and Michelle coming and said, you two are like granddaughters to me. I see you more than my own granddaughters. And when Michelle had a baby girl, she named her daughter Grace, which is very sweet. Um, while some of the residents passed away, Robin then, instead of visiting residents, helped with bingo. She would spin the balls and they would call out the numbers. That's another of her volunteer options. Santana is a hair salon. Robin volunteers there every Wednesday. Robin had been a customer there for many years, even as a young girl. And I asked the owner if she could volunteer with no pay. She washes and folds the towel, sweeps the hair, uh, separates the foil papers on occasion if the owner wants her to go to the bank, the post office. With her aid, she will do so. Robin doesn't get paid, but all the stylists know her, and if they're free, they'll put a French braid in her hair, and at Christmas and birthdays, they give her gifts. Robin looks forward to going. She has people waiting for her. Uh, Robin, who has a membership at the YMCA, was checking passes at the front desk. Um, she was practically the mayor. She recognized everyone and would say, hello, have a nice day. Uh, she has another job at an actuarial firm. I share this with you because this was a friend of ours. He owned the firm and he has all, you know, financials and MBAs, but yet quarterly, he has to send out his quarterly reports. And he said, could Robin help stuff the envelopes and put stamps on? So once a quarter, rather than having his MBAs doing it, Robin goes into the, um, the uh, staff room, not staff room, it's a executive um, conference room, I couldn't think of the word, and very proudly stuffs envelopes. And I wanna tell you, she loves it. It's a regular office, not a special needs office. She's very proud, she has to dress up. And she works and has lunch in the cafeteria downstairs on those days. And if you ask her, she says, I got paid a thousand dollars. She does not make a thousand dollars. She does make a check. They give her twenty dollars, but she's so proud. She thinks she's getting paid a thousand dollars. In addition, Robin volunteers at the community soup kitchen, at the Morristown soup kitchen, once a month with our synagogue. Um, what is so lovely about this is Robin is really making a contribution. She hands out with gloves on her hands the fruit at the end of the line and wishes everybody a good day. Have a nice day. She's been doing that for years. And one year on her birthday, March 9th, over 200 people, guests and volunteers, stood up and sang happy birthday to Robin. She is recognized and appreciated. Friendship Circle. Uh, she's been involved for 20 years now. She was, had a one-on-one -on -one shadow usually a neurotypical high school student who's assigned to a special needs student. And when she was young, they would come to our house. And they also had a Sunday program. And now for adults, they have a social in the evening once a week and Saturday evening events. But now that Robin's 31, she volunteers at the Friendship Circle, not with a special needs adult, but because they are a non-profit, uh, 
She stuffs fundraising packets, party favors, gift boxes, signs for walkathons. She's making a hot contribution and she says, I'm on fire. I want to tell you a story. They had a recognition dinner for the neurotypical high school volunteers and Rhonda was so thrilled because she was volunteering. She walked across that stage and got a wonderful plaque for her volunteer. Had she gotten the Nobel Peace Prize, I don't think she would have been more proud. Now, what does she do for recreation with friends? Does she have a social life? You betcha. I'm gonna go through some things because I don't think most parents leverage the community resources sufficiently. Uh, Robin has a yoga class in Chester. It's a special needs yoga class and there are other adults, but she knows yoga sufficiently that she can now attend a normal mainstream yoga class at the YMCA or other places. Uh, we live in Randolph, but there's a Roxbury, parents of exceptional children, that when Robin was in high school, they ran hikes and socials and outings, and they still do for adults. And Robin's still connected with those people. Music with friends. One of uh, Robin's special needs adult friends is a wonderful singer. And they get together once a week to do karaoke. Friday from 3 to 4.30 at a coffee shop, a quiet time for a coffee shop, they would get together and sing songs. Now they're doing it on Zoom. Robin loves music and dancing. This is where we're leveraging the community. Our Randolph Library has summer concerts in the gazebo behind the library, free to the community every week for 10 weeks. Some of our friends, the Rosens, go pick up Robin and take her. She has her folding chair and bug spray, and she looks forward to dancing behind the library every week. During the winter, the library, except in COVID, has concerts on Sunday afternoon that you have to sign up for, and she goes. She loves it. But Robin also loves school choir uh, concerts and band concerts and the spring musicals. And while we live in Randolph, she goes to the ones in Randolph and Roxbury and Mendham. And very honestly, even if she only goes for 40 minutes and leaves at intermission, she's had a night out. She's gone to professional theater, community theater, to Broadway. Um, I have to tell you, she loves religious services. While I kind of say she, she shouldn't be singing too loudly. Other people say, no, Dinah. Let her sing. We love hearing her sing. She's got a direct line to God. I have to tell you, she is so happy and exuberant at services. Um, a neighbor of mine who's legally blind does pottery in her basement and offered to have Robin and I work with her. Robin has been doing pottery. She has a membership at the Randolph Lake where there's a water park and a snack bar and she brings her chairs and umbrellas. The neighbor's pool this whole summer, knowing Robin didn't have much to do, invited her to her pool. Tim Tebow dance every February. There's this wonderful dance run by the Liquid Church. Fantastic event. Dress up, gowns. It's really something to look forward to. But she's part of our family, too. All the holidays, all part of, uh, we see her often, we visit her. She is part of our life, but as she says, she's an independent woman. My daughter-in-law's family invites her each year to the beach club and barbecues. She goes to the Midland alumni event. She went to the Midland Special Needs School. And once a month on Friday nights, about 45 minutes away, they have an alumni event, dances, costume parties. Every day of the week, she has things going on evening concerts, whatever. I'm not making this up. I want other parents to know this. And then, in addition, we have a holiday dinner for our staff each year. I want to give them that TLC. I give them gifts and bonus checks and handwritten thank yous. And Robin loves this big dinner party. One night we were at the party at a restaurant where they had music. And one of the Santanas, the hair salon clients, came in and Robin went running over and he recognized her, of course, and he said, what is this? What is this? And we explained. He said, oh, 
I'm the manager at Suburban Furniture. I would love to have a special needs individual helping me out at the furniture shop. Becky Slack, another special needs young woman, is now working at this store. Ask people, talk to people. Um, I'm happy to give my staff birthday gifts and celebration because they enable Robin to have this life, but also enables me and Bruce to have this life. So those TLC relationship building, appreciation leads to longevity and her life and mine. I want to have only a few more comments and I'm opening it to questions. The last thing I want to tell you about is our annual Winterfest. What is it? Um, Nancy Delaney had suggested that when they opened their home, they invited the whole community to come to meet um, the residents, to say hello, to introduce one another. I thought that was a very nice idea. And late February, Robin's birthday happens to be March 9th, but this is not a birthday party, no gifts. But Robin loves parties. She loves hosting. She loves being the center of attention. And we've had up to 97 people come to an open house format at Winterfest to her home. Feb January, February are cold. We get her engaged in stuffing envelopes, uh, invitations, stamp, stamping them, return address labels, hand delivering the invitations, mailing them. She makes party favors. She makes food preparation. She decorates her condo. So this is a whole month of fun during the doldrums of the winter time. She made paper snowflakes to hang from the ceiling, but that's not my motivation. That is a nice motivation, but I have an ulterior motive. We have the staff and their families, their kids, their siblings, their parents come. They're all part of Robin's life. I want all of them to be part of our family, invite them every year. Evan and Mindy and my grandchildren come. Evan now knows all the staff, all their parents, their family, like an extended family. We have our extended family come, Robin's cousins and aunt and uncle, but also our friends. Why? I want them engaged in her life. If we're away a weekend, I leave emergency phone numbers with my friends. One's a nurse. I want them to know what's happening in Robin's life. Come to her home. I'm shameless in reinforcing her circle of support. It's a touch point. We also have her coworkers at the hair salon, her bosses, this hair salon owner, neighbors. I want the neighbors in the condo development to know me and my husband. If they see something wrong, I give them my phone number. Please call me. I want them to be part of the community that supports Robin. Uh, there's a butcher at Acme, a very cute guy, very good looking. And Robin had befriended him and invited him to her Winterfest. And he left this lovely message saying that he was going to be away for President's Day weekend. I'm thinking, who is this butcher that Robin had befriended? Well, charmingly, I went and introduced myself. And apparently every time Robin's in Acme, she goes to the butcher stand and whoever's working says, wait a minute, I'll go get Sam. He'll come in and say hello to you. Who in today's world does that? Says hello to the butcher. But you know what? They keep an eye on Robin. And if something were to look wrong, they'd give me a call. So Robin does not read, does not write. She can't count 10 objects. She doesn't tie her shoes. But she has a joyful life. She has a life filled with people. She is recognized all over town. You can't go anywhere without somebody recognizing her. She has a life, a fun-filled, active life, filled with people who love her. It can be done. I want to open it up to questions, and I thank you for your time. That was wonderful. Just a very wonderful presentation. I think it gives parents an awful lot to think about. Um, I have been like watching the questions come up. So there's been a few people have asked about whether this recording will be made available. It is our hope that all of the um, conference presentations 
will be going up online over the next couple of weeks. And the reason we say our hope and the reason we don't promise it at the beginning of this is because sometimes there are technological difficulties and things don't record properly and we're just not able to put them up. So the goal is to get the recording up. Um, so please look out. It'll If it does go up, we will be putting it onto Facebook that it's up and we will tell you exactly where to find it and all of that information. Um, there are some questions about the housing voucher um, and how that works in a parent-owned property. Okay, uh, that's an interesting question. When um, Bruce and I originally got the rental voucher, it was allowed that parents of a special needs child could get a rental voucher for a handicapped child. You cannot, just because your child is poor, buy a house for them and get a rental voucher. But if you are the parent of a special needs child, we were allowed. Um, Maria, I don't know if that's still the law because I heard that may have changed, but we are currently uh, continuing to get it under that clause. Do you want to speak to that, Maria? I will speak to that. Um, so there, before DDD started their own housing vouchers, which is what most of us are using right now, um, DDD did allow parents to pay for housing, provide housing, and there were slightly different rules with vouchers. At this point, people who already had something in place were all grandfathered in. At this point, the division is no longer allowing that. So that does make this model a little bit more difficult to put into place. It's still not impossible, um, but there are more hurdles that have to um, have to be overcome. So, um, so yeah, I know. I, so a lot of, and somebody else had mentioned this. There was, there was some questions. There was also some comments. There was a comment that came up that was like. Um, you know, a lot of the rules have changed since this was put in place. Will you speak to that? And I think I heard it during the presentation that you addressed the fact that you were first on what was called self-determination, which allowed you to pay for an awful lot of things that now you cannot pay for with your DDD budget. So I think you did address in part going through, but some of the rules have changed. Um, but it's still a model that can be worked. It just takes a little bit, uh, a little bit more creativity right now. Um, you have to create an LLC and then have the LLC on the home. Is that uh, legally? So that's also problematic for the division if immediate family members are the principals of the LLC. Um, so, it, yeah, it's, so it's not, so there definitely are some, some difficulties with this. However, there are ways to do it where if, and your model, it's only your daughter with a live-in. But if you have a different model and there could be a live-in and your child and someone else, the someone else can get their voucher, can use their voucher. And then the, your own child would just be paying something through their social security benefit. Um, but then you're, actually, you're getting to kind of capitalize on the funds from the other individual who's living there. So it, it's a little bit more of a piecework um, kind of a patchwork quilt, which is kind of what you're talking about. You know, we, you're getting a phone uh, assistance from here and a utility assistance from here. So we do have to creatively look at the cost for the actual building um, itself that the individual is looking at. And the vouchers don't work in the same way that they had at the point where you were doing this. Um, there are a lot, there was a question about um, the gifts that are given to staff. Um, and I think what the person's getting at is that they're asking, what is the allowable amount of gifts you can give to staff? So I guess my question to you is, is, is Robin giving these gifts to the staff from her own money? Is, is that something that the family's doing? Um, no, I, Bruce and I do not take that out of Robin's social security. You know, we pay for the gifts, we pay for the holiday dinner. Um, but to be honest, it is, you know, well worth it because people who stay and are part of your family and love your daughter, it makes a huge difference. So no, that is not uh, coming out of Robin's question. Okay. That's what I thought. So to answer the question, then there's absolutely no limitation on what um, her parents can do. It's a gift from them. 
if the individual was using it from money that was theirs in an SSI form of a benefit, there are you know limitations because that there is a sole benefit rule. If we're using money that was in a special needs trust, there would be issues with giving gifts because you're not permitted to give gift from money that's in a special needs trust. Um, so there, that would be a limitation as well. So there needs to be funds that are exterior from the individual themselves to sort of keep that type of a model um, in place. We did get a lot of questions too about Easter seals. Some people just asking for clarification of how to spell it and how to find it online. Um, it is Easter, E-A-S-T-E-R, and then seals, S-E-A-L-S. And if you Google it, because I was doing it during this, I was trying to figure out how to put the link from my phone into the chat. I couldn't figure it out, so super sorry. But if you do Google it, everybody, it does come up easily. Um, but we do have a question here. How can you afford the staff with DDD money? And do you supplement, are you supplementing some of that? And what is Easter Seals' involvement? How can I contact them about, about going to college to get DDD money? What, what is the college name and contact? And how many years were Robin, was Robin? Oh, I guess you, they're talking about the school. This is the Benedictine residence. This is the Benedictine yeah. school. That's where they're going. It's, yes. Yeah. So would you like Easter to speak Seals to that? Seals had no bearing on Robin going to the Benedictine school. So separate out those two ideas. Um, Robin was a special needs uh, student, and he was in a uh, special needs school. Randolph District was uh, busing her to a out of district school, and we asked that she be sent to the Benedictine School in Ridgely, Maryland. You can look it up, uh, R I D G E L Y, Ridgely, Maryland. And this was not at all East related to Easter Seals. In truth, while uh, some of the residential schools cost $200,000, $300,000 a year, this was run by nuns. And in fact, it did not cost anything like that. I think um, the school district paid what they would have paid had she stayed in district or stayed at the special needs school. And we supplemented it $2,000 or so which is small investment for her to get a budget at 21 for the rest of her life. So um, I hope that addresses the question. And Easter Seals, I'll give you the phone number for it. I happen to have it here. 800-471-3086. But don't call them asking to get a budget. DDD has to give you the budget. But Easter Seals, if you have a budget, can help you. Does that make sense? Um, another question that here says, um, this is a wonderful model and here are my concerns. Our other child is also autistic, although very high functioning. We will be able to make him a guardian down the road. When we die, he will already be dealing with managing his brother's trust, SSI, Medicaid, et cetera, as well as managing his own life. About how many hours a month does this model require of you and your husband in terms of management, hiring staff, et cetera? It's a fair question. Um, I would say probably uh, 15 hours a week or 10 to 15 hours a week. And the question is, how are we going to sustain this after our demise? Because she's 31 and will probably hopefully outlive us. Good question. Uh, two thoughts. One is that um, we are anticipating hiring a manager to do much of what I am and we are currently doing. Um, in truth, I'm putting together a Robin manual where I outline where all of these um, low-income rental vouchers, all of these are the phone numbers, the addresses, and you know what we send so that it's documented. God forbid I get hit by a bus, we would have it for my son or to hire someone. Um, we also have left a special needs trust for Robin, which uh, we are allowed to pay someone from that trust to manage some of these issues. So it is our hope that in fact, A, we will either hire someone to do it or B, if there's enough in our estate at our demise, she won't have to pursue the rental voucher and the food stamps and uh, hopefully the, our uh, estate will leave enough money. So some of that becomes easier because it'll just come out of there. So 
two, two ways to ask the, you know, the question. Um, I have thought about it. We do have a life insurance policy on myself and my husband so that if God forbid there's a war and we burn through all of our assets or you know, mayhem takes place, even then a second to die, we have an insurance policy that would go to Robin. So we have made um, plans so that she should hopefully be able to sustain this life. Um, so there's another question here that says, where can I find activities or businesses that have activities that my son's budget will accept and pay for? And I think you talked at great length about how all the community connections that you have made, um, are those all paid for by the budget or those are just relationship? Well, um, you can ask your support coordinator and DDD does have a website which lists um, what are DDD approved for payment, whether it's a YMCA, which is approved, or a yoga, which is approved. Um, but what I was trying to highlight was that there are many things like when Robin goes to a, a high school concert for the choir or the high school musical, you know, the costs are negligible. We're not talking Broadway prices. Um, and when she goes to the free library concerts, so much of it, it has no cost at all. Um, and when she does go to a movie or bowling or whatnot, it comes out of her own uh, SSI. It, does that answer the question or is, am I missing a part of the question? No, I think that you answered, um, I definitely think that you answered that question. Um, we have one that's a, a comment and then with a question. So just, it's amazing at, at the details of um, orchestrating this wonderful life for your daughter. The person just has a um, kind of, she actually calls it off topic kind of question. Um, does Robin actually carry a mobile phone? And if so, which service does she use? Robin does not carry a mobile phone. Um, so her aides all do, they pay for them and have them with them. So I could reach them and her, but Robin does not have a mobile phone. I do know there is uh, low income mobile phone options, but Robin does not have one. Okay. Um, and just for a clarification purpose, so you have talked a number of times about she does this with her aid, like when she's at the um, hair salon, if they ask her to go run to the bank or do something. So just to clarify for everybody, the aid is paid for through her budget, through her DDD yeah. budget. In fact, somebody else said, do I pay personally for the staff? No. Fortunately, okay. the one thing that is completely 100% covered is her staff by her DDD budget, and that continues. And that is wonderful, significant, important, and huge. You know, it, that's a, a game changer. Right. Um, I think there's a question here, but I think you already mentioned part, you already answered part of it, which is the when you can no longer manage this. Well, actually, it's a little bit different. When you can no longer manage this, how do you transfer the ownership of the condo to allow Robin to continue to live there? We just actually uh, looked through our um, will and the, we have a special needs trust. It's empty, but set up and the ownership of the house will go into the special needs trust and the trust can maintain it. That is allowable. So if it needs to be repainted or recarpeted or, you know, kitchen update or, you know, whatever normal maintenance might be required, it is allowed. Right. It is also allowed when the trust is owning the real property, um, the real estate taxes, um, you know, those types of expenses can also be paid because what becomes is that money's not coming out to Robin. It's the trust maintaining a trust asset and keeping that asset at its value, which it is required to do. Um, so that definitely does help um, for families out there who are thinking of doing that. What you have to be aware of is having um, enough liquid assets in there that would be able to keep paying all of those um, expenses for the home. And you just wanna make sure you've done some really good planning. So we have a really great question that just came up. People are asking about the tier. So obviously, in order to have round the clock staff in the way that you do and have her budget cover this, she has to be at a certain tier level. Um, do you mind either sharing what her tier level is or um, saying where you think a tier level would need to sort of be in order to do this? So, well, let me, let me say this. Um, Robin is not yet in fee for service. Oh, okay. 
she is in the old system, which means that she hasn't gotten her um, Medicaid tier level budget, which in fact is more than twice the size of her current budget. Um, she's a DA, but she hasn't gotten that. So we have made all this work on, um, you know, about $130,000. She has 24 hour care and it had included rent and whatnot before. So her budget was much lower. I do know, depending on the uh, capabilities of your child and their New Jersey CAP evaluative assessment, they might get more or less than Robin. But like I said, you know, if you need to have multiple individuals in an apartment or a condo, you can to share the budget. Or if they are a higher budget, you may not need to. All right. I'm just kind of scrolling back through the chat to make sure I didn't miss anybody's question. And I, I don't think that I did. Or if there are any additional questions, please kind of send them, uh, send them now. But I'm just double checking. Uh, I just want to close. And I had said in my word is good, if anyone, whether now or in four years when you're ready to do it with your child, wants to email me, I would be fine with that. Um, I know that... Uh, these are big deals and not necessarily uh, you have all the questions right now, but if you were to have questions, don't hesitate to uh, email me. I, I wish you good luck. I think I, I wanted to close by saying it is scary to have a special needs child and to create a life for them, um, you know, and see them happy. That's I think what we all want. Excellent. Well, thank you, everyone. Dinah, thank you so much for being here, sharing your time on a nice Saturday afternoon with us and sharing your experience and expertise. Um, it's always great to hear it directly from a parent. I, all I'm getting right now in the chat is all kinds of thank you. You've been so helpful. This is wonderful. So really do thank you for that. Also want to thank all of you who have come and um, joined our conference and been with us over the last two days. We truly do appreciate it. Please everyone stay safe and be well. And we will be sending out, hopefully able to put all of these um, videos up online. And because you were registered for the conference, we will alert you to that so that you will know where to find um, each of the different um, conference workshops so that you can view them again or check something if you need to. So again, thank you very much. And we definitely appreciate your joining us um, and hope to see you at our next conference. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Be well, be safe. Be well, be safe, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching this Encore presentation from the Fall 2020 Hinkle, Pryor & Fisher Parent Empowerment Conference. With 24 other presentations to view, there is plenty of additional information to help you become empowered. As a reminder, the information contained in this video is not a substitute for individual legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. Copyright 2020 Hinkle, Pryor & Fisher PC Attorneys at Law all rights reserved.